Hi, welcome to Nepi Invest. So in and all my previous videos, I've been just talking about individual companies, whether I like them or not, and what they do, and that sort of thing. I re haven't really delved into my own set of investing rules or strategies. So I'm going to change that today, and hopefully this is going to be the first of a number of videos where I talk about my investment strategies, or Nepi's investment strategies. Now, I think it's very important to have your own strategies in place because my style may be quite different than your style. So I think every single investor strategies or style is going to be different from each other. And it's very important to find your own strategies because what might work for me may not work for you. And so find your own strategies, write them down and try to follow them as close as possible. I think it's very important that strategies or rules can change or evolve over time. And definitely the strategy I'm going to be talking about today has evolved through time and in fact wasn't one of my initial strategies that I had in place when I started my investing journey. So I think that's very important. Uh, it's very important to have buy strategies and sell strategies. Buying tends to be easier than selling, so knowing when to sell can be quite hard. And I think that's going to be the most important thing is knowing when to sell. And the biggest investing mistakes I've made in the past that has led to me to implement this strategy that I'll be talking about today, which is let your winners run, was based off an old strategy that I had that I think that I've discarded, had thrown in the bin. And um, let's get into that right now. So as I mentioned, it's very important to have in, uh, sort of buy strategies and sell strategies. So knowing when to buy can be quite a bit easier than having or knowing when to sell. So always have a sell strategy. So when I first started my investing journey, one of my sell strategies was always take profits. Um, my other size sell strategies were based off if the story of the companies change, if I can't trust management anymore, that sort of thing. But always take profits was an important strategy that I used um, to lock in profits because I always heard, always take profits, you can't go broke if you take profits, that sort of thing. But that strategy has led to the biggest investing mistakes during my journey. So now I'm going to talk about these mistakes in individually and I'll show you why or how this has evolved. So the most recent mistake I made was uh, Fortescue Metals. I thought I was a bit of a genius here because I bought on a breakout just under $4 in early 2019. Sentiment around Fortescue wasn't that strong. They still had a fair bit of debt. Uh, iron ore wasn't, you know, doing that well. And right now, you know, less than $4 sounds quite cheap. And at the point in time, my sell strategy was if the story changes in Fortescue, if something bad happens to the company, um, if management changes, that sort of thing. My other last strategy was if it gets to $8, I'll just take the profits off the book and lock in the profits, that sort of thing. So I got to $8 and I just sold out without even thinking about it. And during the next year or two years, I just saw the share price just keep on going up. And it made me think, was an always take profits the right thing to do here? Because when you take profits off the book, um, just locking those profits, you are leaving potential significant gains off the book. You're, you're losing that potential significant gain. So I sold out at 100% gain, but I missed out on potential 400% gains. So locking in profits or always taking profits um, made me miss out on significant gains in the future. If I go back earlier into my investing journey in 2016, I bought Nearmap. Now, just like my sell strategy for Fortescue, my sell strategy for Nearmap was I was concerned about potential competitors. I was concerned about them being profitable. They weren't profitable. So I thought if the story changes again, I'll sell out. But if the price uh, jumps considerably, I'll sell out then too. So the price went from 35 cents to 55 cents. And when I looked back at that point, I went, I'll just sell out now, I'll just lock in those profits, and then I'll buy another company, and hopefully that goes up. And even though the share price didn't do much for a year or so, the, from 2018 to the middle of 2019, the share price went from about 60 or 70 cents all the way to $4. And that's a significant amount of money I left off the table 
because I decided to take 50% profits when I could have had 1000% profits. So in hindsight, uh, always take profits was a mistake, a fairly big mistake in the end. If I get back even early in my investing journey to EML payments, so this was 2013, I was a much more nervous investor at that point. EML, it wasn't that sexy. Uh, I don't think they were profitable at that stage. I bought at 60 because they were going through this short-term uptrend and I just thought I was being smart. And then when they went up to 65 cents, I went, oh, I'll just lock in 12% profits. I don't know what I was thinking. 12% profits is not that much. And then I missed out on significant gains in the future. Uh, it would have held on a few years. I would have had to hold on for like five more years to lock in those profits. But uh, this would lead me to my next strategy that is always be patient, uh, which I'll talk about in another video. But this is another example where I just thought 12% profits is good enough when I missed out on a significant upside. And my final example is CSL. Now, I don't know what I was thinking here because when I wrote down in my investing journey when I first started, I wrote down a number of companies that I wanted to hold for the long term and CSL was definitely on that list. So I bought in at $61 in early 2013 and for some reason, um, I sold at $82. There was no reason to sell. I had no reason to sell. The only reason I sold was because it went up $21, 30% profits. And I went, that's a fair bit of money, fair bit of profits. I'll take that off the table. i will lock in those profits. And then I just saw the share price rise and rise and rise. CSL is the perfect company at the time, at the moment, just to buy and hold. There's no reason to sell. There's no reason to sell out of the profits. So this is, in fact, I, in my opinion, my biggest mistake. Even though I've missed out on 500% profits in some of those companies, I've missed out on a lot more. This is the sort of company you want to hold on for the long term. And um, when I look back at my biggest mistakes, CSL or selling out at $82 was my biggest mistake. So I've now taken always take profits off the table. There's that red line straight through it. Uh, it's not a factor at all when I sell. So other factors have to be in play. For example, if there's been a significant profit downgrade or a number of profit downgrades, um, if I can't trust management anymore, and in fact, I'm going through this right now with A2 Milk, I'm not sure if I can trust management. I'm very close to selling out. I've been holding A2 Milk for quite a while. It's been a seven bagger for me right now, but just because it's a seven bagger doesn't mean I should just hold on and keep on holding. I'm not sure I can trust management. Now I'll get into a video, I think I might do a video on A2 Milk later. But why is let your winners run one of my favorite, if not my favorite strategy when it comes to investing? And the way to look at this is to look at the maximum returns you can get from going longer stock compared to the maximum loss you can get from going longer stock. And if you don't know the difference between going long or going short, it, going long is just means when you buy and going short is when you sell and you don't have the stock on hand. So I don't go short, I always go long. So when I talk about going long, it just means that's when you buy a company or a stock. So what are the maximum returns you can get from going long a stock. Is it 100%? Well, no. Is it 1,000? No, it's a little bit higher. Is it 10,000%? No, it's actually a little bit higher than that. It's actually technically infinite. So the maximum return you get from owning a company is infinite. It could be $1 now, it can be $100,000 in 100 years or so, or 50 years or so. It's infinite. Um, you can get one company that could own the world in another 100 years. and by that time, it's uh, through the roof. So technically, it's actually infinite. That's the maximum returns you get from owning a company. Now, let's compare that to the maximum losses you can get. So just imagine uh, you own a company and it goes bankrupt. So what's the maximum loss you can get? Is it infinite? Well, no, it's not actually infinite. If you... Uh, you know, buy a company and you put $1,000 in, uh, that's all you can lose. So the maximum amount you can lose from going long a stock is 100% because that's it. You can't get, you can't lose 1,000% of your money. It's only 100%. So just to uh, have... So here I've just drawn up a very hypothetical portfolio and I've just... Sort of a, a sort of a thought experiment here. 
So just imagine you own 10 stocks, put $1,000 each into those 10 stocks, and just hold those 10 stocks for 10 years. So this is sort of a passive investment investing strategy, not a not an active one. So you don't know what these companies do, or maybe you go into a coma on day one, and then you wake up 10 years later. So what are some of the scenarios that could have happened to these 10 companies? So I've gone for a very extreme scenario here where three companies have gone bankrupt, so you lose 100% of the money, but one of those companies has gone up 1,200%, so you become a 12-bagger, which is a, probably a very reasonable scenario. In fact, uh, probably the most unreasonable scenario about this strategy is that three of the companies have gone bankrupt. I think that's probably least likely. So I've just gone through some of the typical returns you can get for some of these companies. So one company's gone only up 10%, one's gone down 5%. Uh, one's gone up 700%, that sort of thing. So the total after those 10 years is $27,000, which is a 270% return, which is a compounded annual growth rate of 10.45%, which is sort of returns you actually are trying to aim for. Uh, if you were asked any person on the street or any investor strategy or in, you know, a, a fund owner or any of those people in professional I would say 10.45% per year is actually pretty good. Now you might say are those high returns, 1,200%, is that reasonable after 10 years? Well, when I was doing that hypothetical portfolio, I was thinking, how many companies can I do I know that have gone up significantly more than 1,200% during the past 10 years? And I could just think of so many. There was just so many. It happens all the time. And so here are a list of some companies that have gone up 10% or so over 1,000% in the last 10 years. And these are just off the top of my head. I did no research in regards to this. So Altium, Appen, Northern Star, Revel, Magellan Financial, MNF Group, Medical Developments, ProMedicus, A2 Mill. And then right at the bottom there, I've got Fortescue because this is one of the greatest examples of wealth creation from just letting your winners run. So Andrew Forrest, let your winners run. So in 2003, it was 0.5 cents. So it wasn't even one cent. And then five years later, it was $12. That's a $240,000% return. And that's why Andrew Forrest, or Twiggy, as he's known, is really rich. If you held $1,000 worth of Fortescue in 2003 and then sold at the height in 2008, um, you'd become a multi, multi, multi millionaire. And some of these other examples, Appen and A2 Milk, it's even less than 10 years, they've gone up significantly more. For Appen, it's been six years since their IPO. They've gone from 50 cents to $36.19. So Breville there is only at 1,100% in 10 years, but that's still a fairly popular company. Most people know who Breville is. Magellan, another very popular company, has gone from $1 to $64 in 10 years. The list goes on and on. In this list, I haven't even got Afterpay, which is a, you know, like kind of, I don't even know why I didn't even think of Afterpay. So there are a lot of examples of companies going up over 1,000% in 10 years. So my example of, in my hypothetical portfolio, 1,200% uh, could be actually underdoing the highest return you might make in your uh, hypothetical portfolio. Of course, it's very important to uh, find the company that's going to go up that amount of money, but um, I definitely think it's possible that you, over a 10-year period you might find a company like that. Now, in my previous hypothetical portfolio, it was just a hold, a buy and hold strategy. There was no active um, selling of any companies that uh, sort of, um, there was no, you know, there was no selling anyway. So in this strategy I've got, or portfolio I've got here is, go back to my original strategy, you've got $1,000 in each stock, but then you've got a sell strategy and you're selling out a company that, um, satisfies any of your criteria and when to sell, and then you reinvest those sellings. So those three companies that went bankrupt, something happened and you went, oh, I've got to sell out of these companies at a 50% loss. Now, of course, 50% loss might be even being conservative there. You might only sell out when it's 25% loss or so. So then you reinvest those $500 into three other companies, and one of those companies does really well. So in that sort of strategy, in the end, you at the end of 10 years, you got $37,650, and that's a 37.7 return and a compound annual growth rate of 14%, which is 
even better. So you've improved your strategy by being your returns by being a little bit more active than being passive. And I think you can even improve on that. So this is a very conservative sort of scenario where you've only got one company really being successful with Ten Bagger, and even then it's probably on potentially on the low side. So this is sort of the strategy that I'll be using in the future where I'm holding onto a company, just gonna let those winners run as long as possible. And then any companies that I do sell, I'll just reinvest that. And in this sort of strategy, you're not even putting more money into the so the strategy. You're just uh, letting this 10,000 just run as long as possible. You maybe, I'm not even talking about reinvesting money you make from your job and that sort of thing, or dividends, that sort of thing. So this is my video on my first strategy, let your winners run, and how I think important it is to my investing style because especially when I uh, sort of integrate it with uh, patience. I think patience is the most important attribute or trait you can have when you're investing. And I've definitely had those mistakes where I've been impatient with the company. I just sold out because I just thought, oh, I'm just too impatient with this. It's not going up. And that's been a significant, um, I suppose, a significant flaw in my investing strategy in the past. And that's something I try to improve as I move forward. So I hope you enjoyed this first video of one of my strategies, Let Your Winners Run. If you have any questions, leave it in the comment section and I'll try to answer any questions. Hope you've enjoyed this video. And again, I'm not a professional advisor, so if you do need professional advice, make sure you seek out a, a professional. So that's all for today. Hope to talk to you later. And I'll do another video. I'll probably do a video on A2 Milk tomorrow in regards to why I'm torn between holding and selling. That's all for today. Have a good day. Bye.